the Advanced Tech Podcast, providing a spotlight for innovators and disruptors. For links and show notes, and to find out how to sponsor the Advanced Tech Podcast, go to advancedtechmedia.org. You can also find and sponsor us on Patreon. If you're listening to us on iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify, please take a moment to subscribe and give us a rating. You can also sponsor us using Bitcoin at advancedtechmedia.org slash sponsor. I'd like to welcome new show sponsor, M3 is 3D. What this is, is an incredibly light, very well-constructed headphone stand. Make sure you go to their site, m3is3d.com. Use the code ATP10 for a 10% discount and check out all that they have to offer. Uh, There's some really cool designs. Again, this is fully 3D printed. It is a headphone stand, simple design, light, well-made. Check them out. Again, that's m3is3d.com. Thanks so much for being a sponsor and enjoy the show. Okay, welcome to the Advanced Tech Podcast. Joining me today is Jennifer Robertson. She's one of the founders of Quasar and she's a marketing and sales lead. Welcome. Hi, great. Thanks. Great to be here. So uh, before we get started and uh, dig into Quasar, can you tell our listeners and viewers a little bit about your background? Yes, uh, happy to. Uh, So, my name is Jennifer. Um, I'm originally from the UK, uh, but I'm currently based in Seattle. Um, I just spent, I think, about five years in California, and before that was in DC, um, and before that was in Europe for a while. So, kind of been uh, sort of all over the place. Uh, My background is in sales and marketing, um, and I have probably about 10 years in uh, the education industry. Uh, I've seen sort of all the way from, they call it from K to gray. So I've seen K-12, um, higher ed, sort of the nonprofit space. Uh, and then I'll give you a fun fact about myself is that um, I love playing basketball. I love watching basketball. Uh, I'm a full on fan. Uh, so there you go, something fun. Very cool. So let's dig into Quasar. And uh, can you talk a little bit about the founding of that, uh, what the purpose of Quasar is and what makes it different? Yes. Uh, Okay, so um, what we do at Quasar is we train people for uh, roles in the digital economy. Um, But how we do that is very different from, I think, most other programs that are out there. Uh, So we we have a heavy focus on skills-based training, which means that we really want to put people in the, essentially in a job setting before they get to the job. So we say, okay, what's somebody going to do on the job? Like, what are the job descriptions that people you know, that companies are putting out there, what are the skills they're requiring, the hard skills, the soft skills, you know, what what are they actually going to do in those jobs? And we say, great, well, we're going to take that and we're going to put it inside of a training program. Um, And so things like, I mean, our focus is on the sort of tech side of things, so software engineering, data science. A lot of those roles, like you work on projects, you have to work in teams, you will do peer code reviews um, or maybe like data analysis reviews. Um, And you know, there's sort of a collaboration and sort of minimum technical knowledge and experience that you're expected to have. Um, and so what we've done is we've designed programs that take you from like zero, so I know nothing about coding or whatever, to, you know, I am ready and capable for a job there. So how we founded the company, um, we, uh, so the founding team, there's three of us, uh, another guy called Kwam Yan Yan, he is originally from France and Togo. He was one of the founders of an uh, internationally recognized IT school called Ecole 42. Uh, so it's a, a French, French establishment. And he came to the US with a guy called Gaetan, who's also French, um, to establish the campus out in California. Pretty successful, launched it. Um, but, you know, just being in the US, we really saw opportunities to, I think, grow the program, serve different kinds of people, uh, really work in and through local communities, do remote programs. Like, there's just so, so much to do. Um, and so you said, you know what? There's there's new like, technologies developing. There's a lot of data out there. You know, how can we use that in learning? How can we really develop the next generation? The next generation in terms of talent, but also the next generation in terms of like the platform that we're using, the technology, the learning, how things happen, uh, the curriculum, sort of everything. Um, and so we said, okay, you know, we're going to, um, say goodbye. It was a nonprofit. So we left the nonprofit, founded our company, and here we are today. Uh, so hopefully that gives you a sort of quick insight into the, what we do. I'd like to dig a little bit into the mission of the company. What's your core, uh, I guess, some of your core values and core mission that you're looking to, to achieve with Quasar? Great. Yes. 
Uh, so at Quasar, we're on a mission to train millions for the digital world and to make that training accessible. Um, so for us, that, there's sort of multiple things within that. Um, in order for you to train millions, you need to be able to scale. So if you think about kind of the traditional education systems, it's sort of you have a professor and they teach people. If you look at a lot of the ratios out there, they're sort of maybe one to seven, one to 10, one to 15. That, that doesn't scale. You know, that you can't take that and do one to a thousand or even, I mean, even one to 200 would be great. And so there's a lot of cost burdens that come with that. Um, but, it, you know, it's kind of natural. It, it, what a lot of them are doing is about knowledge transfer. You know, there's somebody who talks, who gives you the knowledge and there you go. And so we say, okay, partly in order to actually train people for the jobs they need to help them like practice the workplace before they get there, we said, okay, changing, we're changing how people learn, how the learning model is designed. And what that meant is that we can scale. So we can get to that one to 200 or, I mean, eventually that one to 1,000, um, which is pretty significant because that's how you can train millions for the digital world. But then the second part is making that training accessible. So, you know, I think especially in the US, um, when you look at the cost of education, how it's changed over the last 50 years, you know, the student debt crisis, just like how much it actually costs to get any kind of degree, it's extortionate. And I'm just like, that is, that is not always accessible to people at all, but it needs to be. And so we said, okay, we're going to take the like experience that we have, the programs, our platform, how things are designed, and try to bring down the cost of education right now as much as we can. And then with a the view of saying, okay, how much can we push that in the next like five years, 10 years? Um, and so there is a cost element for us to making education accessible, which we think is really important. Some of our learners actually have said, you know, why I chose your company is like, I don't have $20,000 to do a coding boot camp or another degree. You know, I don't want student debt, like, but I can't afford to do that like a hundred dollars a month. And so that was, I think that's a big part of our company and sort of what we're trying to do, our mission, why we exist. And, and so I guess how we're really looking to impact the, the world, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a very ambitious goal, but that's awesome. That's one of the things we, we like doing on this show is, is talking to people who want to change the world in a positive and very substantial way. So that's awesome. So let's talk a little bit about some of the training programs that you offer. Okay, so we have five. We have five training programs at Quasar. Um, I'll give you a list and then I'll sort of share a bit about how they're different because that's one of the big questions we get all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do software engineering, full stack development, data science, cloud and DevOps engineering, and then AI and machine learning. So um, I'm actually going to start with full stack development. So full stack development, you're looking at um, somebody who's going to build both the front end and the back end of an application. Could be a mobile application, could be a website. Um, so sort of, you know you're sort of covering the both both sides of those. So it, I think if you like sort of more the visual or the create like physically creative side of things, um, that's where we find learners really enjoy that program. Meanwhile. If you go into software engineering, our software engineering program, it's a lot more about back-end programming. So it's a lot more about infrastructure, software architecture, um, algorithms, optimization, performance. You know, I think it's a lot more complex. So if you really like solving complex problems um, and especially doing so in a team, then that one's a really good, good option for you. Uh, data science is, I think, in part, I mean, it's almost data engineering. It's part like programming part data analysis um, and with that is sort of you're seeing the whole data life cycle from collection to storage to analysis to you know thinking critically to just dis like displaying it communicating it and understanding like what are the business implications for it certainly a high demand job personally I think it's fascinating probably one of my favorites but um, I'm also not a software engineer so I'm probably a bit biased there uh, <laughs> then um, so AI and machine learning it's Probably the cousin of data science, uh, a bit less focus on the business side of things, and more focus on like working with really large and complex data sets, and also on your algorithms, what you're using, and really on like optimization and performance. So you know it's kind of almost easy to get to a point where your your algorithm is 85% good, or, mm -hmm. or effective, or whatever. But it's how do I get from that 85% to the 90%? And that 90% to the 92% and then 92 to 93, there's a lot of work, especially that goes into the last few percentage points. And so, you know, it, 
you don't really have the same, I guess, like sense of accomplishment necessarily for completing projects over and over and over again because you're working so much on that like optimization side of things. However, it's you know it can be a pretty incredible feat to get from like the 93 to the 94 percent or the 95.5 to 96. So there you go. So it's just a kind of a different approach. Then our cloud and DevOps engineering, I mean, it's a lot about, I think, problem solving and almost putting out fires. Like realistically, that's what the job is going to be. Um, so you're handling a lot more of the like infrastructure, working with a lot of cloud tools. So um, AWS or Google Cloud Platform or Microsoft Azure. And you, you essentially have the ability to deliver and help, I guess, maintain, monitor the infrastructure for a company, especially if they're enterprise level. But when things break, they're like, oh, my server's gone down. You know, you're the one they called to say like, hey, we need you to fix this. And by the way, we need you to fix this now. Like now, mm -hmm. now, now, <laughs> not tomorrow now. Um, so that gives you sort of a bit of an overview of the different topics that we cover um, and sort of what you do. So you've worked with an impressive list of companies. Um, is this something you can talk about? Would you like to highlight some of those programs and some of your, your successes? Um, I'd like to share some of the, uh, I guess, stories more from the learner's point of view, if that's okay, and sort of where, they, where they are come up with stuff. Because personally, I think some of our learners are inspiring, and I have an enormous amount of respect for them. Um, so we have one guy, and I won't name names for, I think, out of respect of their privacy. So we have one guy who is based in California and was working in, as a assistant in the, like, honestly, medical administration field and said, you know, I really want to get into like data science and machine learning. I don't quite know which one yet, but, you know, let's start, let's roll. And then I think as we go, we'll figure that one out. Hats off to the guy, um, worked his butt off, got an interview with Tesla as mm -hmm. a data annotation specialist. So these are guys who are really working on providing the inputs of data for a lot of the machine learning algorithms they use at Tessa. So it's a very interesting job if this is what you want to do as an engineer later on. Um, and so he made that transition, has been very successful, is doing really well. And I'm like, I mean, I want to hug the guy. <laughs> it's a remote <laughs> program, so you know, I can't, but um, it just, it's so inspiring to see like how he's done and he's so happy. And he's like, you know, I, I permitted myself, I gave myself the opportunity to say, I'm going to try this, I'm going to do it. And I was like, wow, hats off. So that's a pretty cool one. Then another one is we had a mother of two, a wife and mother of two, uh, who said, hey, you know, I really want to get into the software engineering industry. We kind of worked with her a bit before. Um, and so she came into our programs, went through, and then interviewed with Capgemini. So the innovation branch of Capgemini came to us and said, hey, you know, we'd be interested in interviewing some of your learners. Um, we know a lot about you guys, the programs you've built, your reputation. And so uh, they did. And they hired her as an intern. And they absolutely loved her, offered her a full-time job as a lead front-end developer. She is over the moon. I mean, she worked her butt off. And that's not easy, I think, being a wife and a mother. And so then Capgemini came back and said, OK, we want more. <laughs> <laughs> we want more interns. Um, and so they actually just took on another guy and they, you know, just very different from the last person, the last intern they took, but it's going very well. So there I just, just a couple of stories and examples of where people are and how they're doing um, in our programs. Awesome. So from a learner's perspective, um, how would they engage with Quasar? And what would be like a typical learning path um, in any one of these programs? Yeah, great question. I guess there's diff different aspects to what a typical learning path looks like. Um, but we'll do the sort of what you'd actually do in your day or in a week, and then like what that translates to in terms of curriculum as well. So if you join the Quasar programs, you're just first of all joining a learning community. Like we want to know you, we want to um, get you knowing other people or building relationships with other people in the programs, mm -hmm. um, because it's really important for your motivation and retention. We have a daily stand-up meeting um, so, you know, if you're in the full-time program, Monday to Friday, then we do stand up every day. If you're in the part-time programs, then, you know, it's on whatever day you have the part-time programs. Then we do live coding sessions uh, where we, like, we actually pull up uh, IDE, so Integrated Development Environment, uh, share the screen, and we code. Like, it's pick a problem, and, and we're going to go at it. We also have, uh, we call them coding collaboration sessions. 
So we put people into groups, um, small groups. We give them a technical interview question and then they have to solve it and they have 30 minutes and then they have to come back and we do sort of short presentations where people share the code that they wrote, how they solved the problem. Um, it's fascinating. The students really enjoy that one. Um, and then we also have what we call Tech Startup of the Week. So every week we look at a different startup. And it's a fascinating just to see like what is going on in the world out there. Um, you know, I, I, it's just incredible. We've seen everything from like garden technology to pet technology, which by the way, there's a whole ecosystem around that. Like, you know, to implement implementations of AI in solving cancer. Like it, it's just great because it gives learners just this ex exposure to where they could go or what they could do in industry. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pers probably one of my favorites. So that's sort of, you know, in a given week, that's what you'll be doing. Um, obviously, you also do a lot of coding, like you have projects, you have exercises, so you'll be, you know, coding or look, looking things up or figuring something out or debugging your code or, you know, maybe helping someone else out on the platform who's struggling. So it's very, I think, very collaborative. Then in, ter in terms of the actual curriculum, so um, everyone starts off in what we call the preseason, so it's sort of a quick introductory course. Uh, you're learning the fundamentals of computer programming, software engineering. Um, then you will move on to, I want to say, call them software engineering fundamentals. So it's covering like data structures, algorithms, um, different types of data, like kind of really understanding like how a computer works and thinks at a fundamental level, although it's not binary. Uh, and then you move on to your specialization. And so you start going into your specialized track and you go from there. So you get a really good sort of foundation um, probably similar to a computer science degree so that you can then move on to your specialty. Cool. I like the fact that you include algorithms as a, these kind of basic fundamentals, because I think most systems uh, going forward are going to be using some element of data or machine learning. So it's interesting that you're tackling that from the front and highlighting that for your students. Yeah, it's so important. Like it just is, you're absolutely right. You know, that is where the world is going. Um, and so I think if you understand I mean, it's like starting small and then getting bigger. So you have that ability to understand more complex algorithms because you've had to build smaller ones uh, that mm -hmm. then become more complex and bigger. You know, I mean, it even applies to like how you browse the internet or what social media you're using. Like when you understand how those algorithms are sort of built, you hopefully are like a little more aware and maybe a little less prone to being exploited by algorithms. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, it's important to, uh, to know the, the I guess it comes down to knowing what questions to ask and asking the right questions. Yeah, I agree. So, a uh, couple more questions and then I want to move on uh, and talk about the tech scene. So what can students expect as far as time commitment, how long the programs are, is there like a particular standard? I guess what level of, of expectation of commitment they're going to need in order to successfully navigate the programs? Great question. So in our programs, we have three different kinds and they come with, I want to say, three different levels of commitment. So we have our full-time program that runs Monday to Friday and you should think of it like a full-time job. You should generally work about nine to five. Um, you know, the stand-up meetings are in the morning and you generally go through the day. There, I mean, there's flexibility within that. You know, if you want to work in the evenings, that's fine and you know, take a break at lunch, great. Uh, but it, it's generally sort of parallel to a uh, full-time job. The other option we have is our Tuesday, Thursday program. So it's a part-time program during the week. And we expect you to be sort of present in our meetings or coding also from about, it's about nine to 4.30. And so, you know, it, it's a great opportunity to be spending time with other people doing those live coding sessions, those coding collaborations. Then outside of those two days, you are like, you have flexible time to get your work done and get your coding done. Then we also have our third option, which is our Saturday program. It's just a single day. Um, we have meetings throughout the day, uh, about 9.30 to 3.30. Um, so there's sort of a bit more flexibility. Um, and then, you know, a lot of people in, those, in that program also have full-time jobs. Like they work Monday to Friday, and so the time they have is on essentially on the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, with that, the flexibility is in that you get your work done outside of those Saturday hours. Um, so, I mean, a lot of people also work on Saturdays, like they do their coding work on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of the, the time, I guess, commitments that we have. In terms of how long the programs take, you know, if you're full time, I want to say they're between nine to 12 months. If you're part time, um, I'd say probably more 12 to 24. It depends on what your specialty is. 
But it also depends on like what experience you're coming in with. You know, if you have a computer science degree and you come to our programs, you're going to go a bit faster than somebody who has no experience whatsoever. And that's totally fine. You know, so the point is that you're becoming competent. Um, you know, it's not like, oh, I did it faster than you. you know, nobody really cares. Like, we, we want you to get into jobs and, and do well. So. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, um, it's really good uh, that you're focusing on, on what the industry standards are because a lot of times, you know, like people will go, like we said at the very beginning, or you were saying at the very beginning, people will go to school, they'll take a long time uh, completing you know, a computer science degree, or maybe they'll switch into something. Um, so that's four years and a considerable amount of debt. And sometimes it's three and sometimes it's five, depending on your specialty. Yeah. Um, and if you go on and do master's or PhD, that's even more time and more cost, uh, regardless of whether you're sponsored or not, or have some kind of scholarship. So, yeah, it's uh, it's a really unique way, I think, that you're tackling this by focusing on what the industry wants, because uh, there's a huge gap right now with um, trained individuals uh, able to step directly into, you know, a more technical role. And I think it's also great for people that are transitioning. And maybe they're in a, a role that's, you know, starting to disappear and they're not really sure where, you know, where to go. They have number of years left in their career so the fact that it's it's more compressed i think is also very interesting yeah it's i think it's what a lot of learners are looking for you know strata education network have done a lot of surveys recently as have mckinsey i mean especially with the pandemic and, and that's exactly what they're seeing to, to a t that's what people are looking for they want those skills-based programs they don't want to do a four-year degree you know i mean we have a lot of career switchers or people who are saying like my you know, where I am, I need to shift into the technical side of things. Um, and so it's really amazing to see our learners transform um, and see where they go. All right, so let's switch into the tech scene. So you um, recently moved from Silicon Valley up to Seattle. Um, I wanted to get a sense of what you're finding the tech scene is like in, in either place. And I realize you've just moved to Seattle recently, so you may not have had much time to explore. But um, what are your initial observations? I think what's interesting about Seattle is that they they have a few very large firms. Obviously, Amazon, Boeing, Microsoft, like those are the top top ones here. Whereas, you know, in Silicon Valley, I mean, I couldn't even name all of them. There's so many. Like, there's just so many of those top tech firms down there. And so, you know, I, I think when we look at how the um, city is adjusting, where they're investing in terms of like development, uh, long term strategy, um, it's amazing to see the role and impact of so few companies in one area and so many companies in another, that being Seattle and California, um, on like where things are going, where the population wants to work. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, I think that's really interesting. The other thing at Silicon Valley and sort of the whole Bay Area in general, um, they have and they want top engineers across the board, all their companies do. I think to give credit to Seattle, Right now, what we're seeing is the entry level jobs tend to be genuinely a bit more entry level than the ones in the Bay Area. A lot of the jobs in the Bay Area that are entry level say, you know, you need two to three years of experience. I'm like, that's not entry level <laughs> you know, <Absolutely>. at all. <laughs> it's just not. Um, and so, you know, I think that's where, you know, right now I, I have a lot of respect for Seattle in that. Um, I really hope to become and help uh, grow their ecosystem here, especially the talent side of things. You know, I'm certainly interested to learn more about the Seattle ecosystem as well um, and to continue our, our efforts in California. So we'll see what happens. Very cool. So if people are looking to, so two questions. Um, first, do you have a question for our audience? And then also, how can people reach you? Oh, do I have a question for the audience? I think my question might be, what is it that's stopping you from getting into tech if you want to get into tech? And how can you go about using structured problem solving to get rid of the barriers that you have? Maybe that's two questions. I hope that's okay. Yeah, that's good. That's <laughs> but, good. you know, maybe a sort of inspirational moment there. So that would be the question for the audience. Uh, then in terms of how to reach us uh, here at Quasar, um, certainly the best way is to just go to our website and fill in a contact form. Um, I actually monitor that one, as does uh, some of the other folks at our company. So um, you'll get straight to us. And we have to answer sort of any questions that you guys have. Awesome. And um, do you have like a standard start for some of your programs? So if people are looking to, like, do you have a fall curriculum or um, spring curriculum? Or can they kind of start you know, ad, ad hoc? 
We have upcoming start dates in July. Uh, and then, we, so we generally do every two months. So we'll have more, we have more in September. And then um, I believe it's the beginning of November before Thanksgiving, before the holidays, we want to get people in mm -hmm. and get them rolling. Um, and then we will pick up again in January. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jennifer. I really appreciate your time. Um, we'll make sure that all the links to Quasar and, and various other sources of info are in the show notes. And yeah, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks. This has been great fun. And uh, I've really enjoyed being a guest.